Hi everyone, and welcome back to the 24th video for the New Testament survey course. In this section, we'll look at Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Like Romans, Galatians has been a very influential book in the church throughout the centuries. Let's get right to the background of this book. The author is the Apostle Paul, and he called himself an apostle, and he emphasized that his apostolic call was directly from God. God was the power behind what Paul was doing, and he wanted the Galatians to know it. And he also mentioned all the brothers with him. Paul was not alone in his opinions, and he was also recognized by significant leaders and Christian workers. So you might notice that Paul seems a bit defensive in the way he described himself in this book, and we'll see why in just a bit. The recipients are churches in the territory of Galatia. Notice it's plural, churches, not just one church, because Galatia is not a city, but a province. So this book was written to a group of churches in various cities and towns in a larger area. And there is a debate exactly which churches Paul was writing to, because historically, the Roman province of Galatia was in the northern part of Asia Minor. The problem is that Paul didn't ever visit there, as far as we know from the book of Acts. Therefore, some have suggested that he traveled there after the book of Acts, and if that's the case, then Galatians was written fairly late. However, recent scholarship has recognized that the borders of provinces were sometimes changed during the Roman Empire, and this larger area was called Galatia at the time of Jesus and Paul. And this includes the cities of Antioch, Lystra, Derbe, and Iconium, all of which Paul visited and in which he started churches on his first journey. So if these churches are the recipients of this letter, which I think is more likely the case, then Galatians was written fairly early, before the Jerusalem Council, which addressed the same issues addressed in Galatians. And that would be why Paul never mentioned the authority of the Jerusalem Council agreeing with him on these issues, because it had not yet taken place. So the date of Galatians is probably around 48 AD, and is possibly the first epistle that Paul wrote. Now, let's talk about the occasion which caused Paul to write this letter. First, these were churches that Paul had started not too long before. There were genuine churches with genuine believers, but they were young churches with new believers, and possibly they did not yet have a fully developed understanding of the relationship between Christ and the Old Testament law, and how that applied to Christians. You see, in the Jewish synagogues of the day, out of which many of these churches were started, there were people called God-fearers. These were Gentiles who were drawn towards the Jewish faith. They believed it to be true, or at least worth learning about, but they had not yet fully committed to being Jewish by being circumcised. So, they were considered kind of second class in the synagogues, not really fully Jewish, but just seekers and still outsiders in some sense. And this same attitude likely influenced the Galatian churches as well. In addition, as we saw in Acts, these new churches experienced persecution by the Jews, who had also persecuted Paul. And this made it difficult to live as a Christian in this area. And another problem is that the churches were infiltrated by outsiders. Most likely they were ethnic Jews as well. And they probably had some tie to the Jerusalem church, because there's evidence from this letter that they played the Jerusalem card over against Paul. And these outsiders called Paul's gospel into question. Possibly they intended to do the Galatians a favor by helping them to keep all the Old Testament rituals and rules, and thus to reduce the persecution from the Jews who were troubling them. And they argued for keeping the law by highlighting the Old Testament and Jewish roots of Jesus, which, by the way, Paul had already taught them. But the outsiders also argued from the Old Testament that there are certain necessary things to do to be part of the people of God, including circumcision. Now, this is not a completely dumb argument. As we see in Genesis chapter 17, to not be circumcised is to not be a part of God's Old Testament people. And the law was given by God, so of course his people should keep it, in order to not abandon God, as it is argued many times in the Old Testament. 
But the outsiders made this the central argument about how to be the people of God, how Gentiles could be included. Paul said that their full inclusion is law-free, but the outsiders said that inclusion is by embracing the law and taking on Jewish identity. And they argued that this is the way to get the blessings of Abraham. And the ritual of circumcision was at the center of the controversy. But that issue has many implications beyond just this ritual, such as how are Gentiles included in the church? How can all people groups experience the blessings of Abraham? And what is the status of the Old Testament law for New Testament Christians? And the outsiders also argued against Paul himself. They apparently claimed that Paul was not authorized. Paul was not really one of the Twelve Apostles. He was a renegade wannabe. He was not officially ordained and sent by the Jerusalem Apostles, and so he was not legitimate, according to their view. And in this way, they called Paul's credentials into question. And they claimed that Paul had changed the gospel. They implied that he had perverted it to make it easier for the Gentiles by leaving out the difficult parts of the Old Testament law, like circumcision. They claimed, in essence, that Paul had given the Galatians Christianity light. So they accused Paul of being a people pleaser, unfaithful to God, in order to win a big following. And they accused him of duplicity and inconsistency because he circumcised Timothy, but not Titus. And so they claimed Paul promoted sin. They thought that throwing out the law will lead to sinful license, to a do whatever you want kind of spiritual anarchy, the same accusation that Paul addressed in Romans. Now, all of this is apparently what they claimed based on how Paul responded in this letter. And apparently, the Galatians were believing them, and were starting to turn back to Judaism as the proper way to serve Christ, and taking on all of the law's requirements. And again, this is not a completely stupid move if you just make a few assumptions. And by the way, I'm trying to help you understand how tempting this was, not so that we would be tempted to do the same thing, but to realize how easily we can be tempted by this mindset if we don't guard against it. It makes sense if we only grant a few innocent-looking assumptions. But as we'll see, it is a completely stupid move because those assumptions are bad. And Paul recognized that these assumptions and conclusions fundamentally distort and misunderstand the gospel. I think that for Paul, he saw that the root of the controversy went much deeper than how to be included. It goes right to the heart of the gospel, how to be justified, how to be forgiven and reconciled to God. What was at stake was salvation by God's grace alone through faith versus somehow needing to contribute to the cause of our own salvation by our behavior and obedience. So notice how many times Paul contrasted faith in Christ with works of the law. Martin Luther clearly saw the importance of this. He wrote, For once we lose our belief in justification, all true Christian doctrine is lost. There is no middle ground between the righteousness of the law and Christian righteousness. Anyone who strays from Christian righteousness must fall into the righteousness of the law. In other words, when people lose Christ, they slip back into reliance on their own works. And as we'll see, Paul agreed with Luther, and he fought vigorously against falling back into the works of the law. Now, just to be clear, Paul had no problem whatsoever with Jewish believers circumcising or keeping the law as part of their cultural custom, and he never suggested that they stop doing so. The issue is about how people, especially Gentiles, are made right with God and the basis of our relationship and right standing with Him. And that includes both our initial entrance into good standing and our continuation in that standing. And if anyone, either Jew or Gentile, suggested it was in any way because of our good behavior, then Paul would have objected. And so, Paul's purpose in writing was fairly straightforward, but had a few aspects. First is obviously to combat the false teaching with true teaching. 
Paul showed how they were wrong, and he taught them what was right. And Christians have to fight falsehood for our own protection and for the good of those around us. I think a good rule is to be against falsehood by being for the truth. Be against bad ideas more than against people, and pray for people's repentance, that they would come to know the truth. In other words, always emphasize the truth that you are for more than you emphasize the falsehood that you are against. And so, Paul's purpose was to protect and rescue the Galatians and turn them back to the true gospel. Because heresy is cruel, and sometimes the loving thing to do is to challenge people away from false doctrine. I think of it like a good mother who will fight for a child that is being grabbed by a kidnapper. Now, this might risk injuring the child in the fight, but a loving mother will do it because it is so much better than losing the child. Paul made such a big deal about this because the outsiders were subverting the true gospel and hurting the Galatian people. And one of Paul's main strategies was to remind them of the true gospel so that they could see the difference and to see what was really at stake. But in order to do this, Paul also needed to respond to criticism of his ministry and his gospel. There was a tension that Paul had to navigate in this. One of the issues was his relationship to the Jerusalem apostles. Paul insisted that he was not dependent on them. He received his gospel and commission directly from Jesus. But at the same time, he was not against them. He was in agreement with them, and they were in agreement with him. He was not dependent on their approval, but he had their approval. And likewise, Paul was not inconsistent or hypocritical with the law regarding Gentiles, but rather he was entirely consistent to the gospel, even when others, like Peter, were not. And he therefore had to explain more thoroughly the relationship of Christians to the Old Testament law. And again, there was a tension that Paul had to navigate. On the one hand, he had to avoid a legalistic pursuit of righteousness by obedience to the law. But at the same time, he had to avoid throwing out the moral standards revealed by God, leading to license and moral anarchy. So, Paul clarified how Jesus and Christians are connected to the Old Testament. Christ is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament, including the law. And Paul refused to speak against the law. But at the same time, he argued that Jesus and Christians are different from the Old Testament. And so, He refused to submit to the law as a means of righteousness. And therefore, he explained the character and purpose of the law in its relationship to Jesus, to the gospel, and to Christians. And by the way, the same tension is something churches of every age need to wrestle through. And then finally, Paul needed to clarify and proclaim the true gospel and its relation to all of these questions and issues. So now, let's look at the organization of Galatians to ge- by giving an overall outline. And the development of Paul's argument is important for understanding Galatians, so I'll go into a little bit more detail here than I usually do. The first section is a standard epistle introduction, except that Paul used it to, cl- to clearly defend himself and his gospel. He emphasized that he was an apostle, and not because of any human commission or approval, but because of God's call and gospel, which is not dependent on any human. In this gospel, he said, is about the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself on behalf of our sins. That is, to restore our broken relationship with God and rescue us from this present evil age. Then the next section is a warning against false gospels and a defense of the only true gospel. Paul rebuked the Galatians. He was shocked that they were abandoning the gospel for a false gospel, a counterfeit. And he warned them against doing this because there is no other gospel, and all the other so-called gospels are really perversions of it, and therefore are cursed. Then the next major section is Paul's defense of the true gospel. And he did this in three ways, in three subsections. First, He defended the gospel by telling the narrative of his own conversion, call, and ministry. He started off 
by insisting that he was not trying to please men, but rather he was proclaiming the gospel he had received by revelation from Christ himself. Then he talked about his early life and conversion. He was a Jew, and he persecuted the church. He used to be just like the people who were insisting that the Galatians keep the law. And he, he was even more zealous and conscientious about it than they were. He was a, a top-tier law keeper, far surpassing the outsiders. But God sovereignly converted him by revealing Christ to Paul. And he called Paul by his grace to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. And then Paul emphasized that he did not seek human approval from the Jerusalem leaders, but he received his call and commission directly from God. However, he wrote, he later did have interaction with the Jerusalem leaders. He met privately with Peter and James, and the church praised God when they heard of his conversion. Why did he mention this? I think it was to show that he was in agreement with the Jerusalem church, but not dependent on the Jerusalem church. Because the gospel is not dependent on the church. The church is dependent on the gospel. The church did not create the gospel. The gospel created the church. Next, he told of this, his later interaction with the Jerusalem church. He told them the gospel that he preached, and he would not allow Titus, who was a Gentile, to be circumcised. And the Jerusalem leaders agreed with him on both issues, and they recognized Paul's call. But Paul made it clear that they added nothing to his call or his gospel. Again, this is all evidence that Paul's gospel and his commission were both in agreement with the rest of the church, but not dependent on them, because they were from God directly. Then, Paul told of an episode where he rebuked Peter, the leader of the apostles, because Peter was wrong, and he was not living according to the law-free gospel which Peter himself agreed with. So Paul publicly rebuked him for forcing Gentiles to adopt to traditions that Peter himself did not keep. And then he gave the theological reason for his rebuke of Peter, because Jews and Gentiles are justified in the exact same way. Jews and Gentiles are all sinners, but those in Christ are now experiencing the new eschatological reality. They were par they're part of the new creation. They've died to sin and live with Christ, because Christ lives in them with his new life. Now, this should sound very familiar, because it's the same general argument that Paul made in Romans. And Paul's conclusion is that he refused to attempt to find righteousness by keeping the law, because to do so would be going in the wrong direction. It would be to set aside, to reject the grace of God, and to lose the true way of righteousness, which was given by God's grace through Christ. Now, all of that is Paul's defense of the gospel using his own story. In the next short subsection, Paul defended the gospel by the Galatian church's own experience. He reminded them that they did not receive salvation, experience God's Spirit and miracles, because they kept the law. They experienced all these things by believing the proclamation of the gospel. Both their objective relationship with God and their subjective experience of salvation had come by grace through faith and not by works of the law. And Paul brought in the scriptural proof of Abraham, who believed God and it was credited to him to be righteousness. Then in the third subsection, Paul defended the gospel with scripture and by teaching true theology. First, Paul showed from the Old Testament that God's blessing came to Abraham through faith, and those who trust God, like Abraham, share in his blessing. But relying on the law only brought a curse, because no one could keep the law, and therefore no one is ever justified by the law. However, Christ rescued us from the law's curse by becoming a curse by hanging on the tree, in order that the blessing of Abraham and the promise of the Spirit might come to those who believe. For this reason, then, Paul needed to explain the relationship between the giving of the law and Abraham's promise. He said, The law was a temporary and interim arrangement, which neither nullified the promise nor gave an alternate way to receive God's blessings. 
Rather, the law was to temporarily protect and lead people until Christ came. And it was to lead people to Christ when he came. The law was never intended to bring righteousness. The law will either lead us to sin when we try to achieve our own righteousness, or it will force us to Christ to receive his righteousness. Because we realize that our own righteousness by works will never be enough. The law will never be a means of earning any standing with God, because it was never intended to. Therefore, believers are not under the law, but heirs to Abraham's promise through faith in Christ. Next, Paul illustrated this by an argument from salvation history, comparing it to a child coming of age. Just like a child comes into the benefits of his inheritance when he reaches a certain age, in the same way, at the right time in history, God sent his son to rescue us from the control of the law and bring us to our inheritance. And thereby, God sent his spirit to, conf to confirm that we're not slaves to the law, but children of God. Then Paul applied all this in a plea for the Galatians to not go back to slavery under the law. He expressed his worry for them because they had changed from their former friendship with him, and he asked them to reject the, the false teachers and return to their former zeal. Then Paul used an illustration from the Old Testament law to prove his point. He challenged them, if they respect the law so much, they should actually learn from the law. And the law told that Abraham had two sons, which Paul said represent the two covenants, one from a slave woman, born according to human achievement, and one from a free woman, born according to God's promise. One represented God's people, and one did not. Those who trust Jesus for their salvation are like the child of the free woman. They are persecuted by the child of the slave because he does not have a part in their inheritance. And therefore, God's people should never go along with the other way, which is just a road back to slavery. In other words, Paul commands them not to go along with the false teachers, but to throw them out. Then Paul plainly applied this by saying, Christ has set you free. Don't submit again to slavery to the law. That is, don't submit to circumcision, which is of no benefit and will cut you off from the grace of Christ. Circumcision does not matter. Living by rules does not matter. Faith working out in love is what matters. And Paul warned and commanded them to reject the false teachers and their teaching, because they and those who follow them will be punished. Paul, by contrast, will hold firm to the cross, even if it means being persecuted. Then, in the next major section, Paul applied the gospel and its implications to the Galatian situation. He counseled them to live in the freedom Christ achieved for them. But this freedom is to serve others, not to take advantage of others. And they were to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. To walk by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to bear the fruit of the Spirit, not the works of the flesh, and to conform to the Spirit. And they were to live rightly towards one another, bearing in one another's burdens, living responsibly, and honoring the leaders. God's people are to do good towards others as long as we have opportunity. And then this book ends with a standard epistle conclusion. Paul gave a personal autograph and greeting. Then he gave kind of a parting shot against the false teachers who boasted in the flesh. But Paul would not boast in anything but the cross of Christ. And he ended this letter with a blessing, a warning, and a grace wish. That is the overall organization of this book. Now let's look at the content of Galatians. In general, as we saw in the organization, a lot of this book is autobiographical about Paul. Most of what we know about Paul's life comes from Acts and Galatians. And in this book, he talked about his conversion, his call, and his ministry. He used to be extremely zealous for the law and Jewish traditions, even more than the outsiders who were trying to lead the Galatians astray. But now he knew better, because he was converted to Christ. 
And this background helped him to show the Galatians the foolishness of going in that direction. He had been there, done that, and he never wanted to go back. He had gone down that road and found that it is a dead end. Notice also that Paul drew on the big picture story and theology of the entire Bible to make his argument in Galatians. He used what is called salvation history and biblical theology. That is, not just the individual stories and episodes of the Bible, but how they all fit together in a cohesive whole. Paul communicated along the lines of God's entire strategy and plan from the beginning to the end, and how all the parts contributed to this unified plan. And that included stress on the timing and how one part developed into the others. There is a unity in the diversity of the Bible. There is a continuity and a discontinuity in what God is doing with this world. And Paul brought all that understanding to address the Galatians' misunderstanding. And it's also helpful to understand that when Paul talks about the ritual of circumcision in this book, he's not just talking about circumcision. The ritual of circumcision is what the false teachers were making a big deal about, so Paul needed to address it. But for Paul, the issue was really the mindset of needing to keep the law in order to be right with God. Circumcision was just one example of this. This book is really about an approach to salvation by keeping the law, which Paul stressed will never result in salvation, but only in a curse. So the issue at stake in Galatians is really about the means of salvation and justification before God, not just about inclusion of Gentiles, never just about circumcision, which Paul clearly said is really a non-issue. The real issue was about how to be in right relationship with God. So now let's move on to looking at some key verses in Galatians. The first key passage is from Paul's warning to the Galatians. In chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul wrote, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Now, this passage comes at the place in the letter where the readers would have expected a typical thanksgiving. But instead of thanksgiving, they received a rebuke. Instead of gratitude, Paul expressed astonishment and shock at what they had done, kind of a, a verbal slap across the face. And he used very stark terms. They had deserted Christ for a different gospel, a false gospel. They were not just changing to another form of Christianity but they were completely abandoning it. And so, the stakes were high, and Paul did not mince words. Some had perverted the true gospel. In other words, they were trying to change it into something it is not. They were not adding to it. They were not teasing out its inferences. They were not just applying it in a different manner. But they were rejecting it and trying to put a counterfeit in its place. Now, some things are peripheral, and we can disagree in brotherly love, but some things are fighting matters. And here, Paul was fighting in black and white terms. If anyone, and Paul said absolutely anyone, if anyone preaches a different gospel, they are cursed. Paul used a very strong word that has connotations in the Old Testament of being totally destroyed. Because the gospel is more important than the messenger. So even if a supernatural messenger, even if Paul himself, differs from the biblical gospel, the gospel is not wrong. The messenger is. Because the gospel is the standard and authority, not the messenger. The gospel judges the messenger. The messenger does not determine the gospel. And then, because this concept is extremely important 
Paul wrote the same thing a second time to underline his point. Then are some key verses from the section where Paul defended and explained the gospel. In chapter 2, verses 11 through 21, Paul wrote, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Now, in these verses, Paul told the story of his confrontation with Peter. Apparently, they were eating with Gentiles, thus not keeping Jewish kosher tradition. But then Peter started to pull away and only eat kosher, apparently because of what others thought and probably to minimize the possibility of persecution. But Paul saw a deep gospel problem with this, and he told Peter that he was wrong for doing it. He told him to his face, publicly, that what he was doing was not acting in conformity to the truth of the gospel. And then Paul narrated why Peter was wrong, giving the theological reasons. Peter himself did not live by the Old Testament, knowing that Jesus had dispensed with food restrictions. So, how could he force Gentiles to follow these laws? And there were deeper issues, because Jews and Gentiles are justified in the exact same way. Both groups are sinners, needing salvation, and both receive righteousness in the exact same way, by faith and not by keeping the law. Because the law has never been a means to righteousness. No one can be justified in that way. And now, because of Jesus, we are in a new eschatological reality. We are at least partly in the already portion of the already not yet tension. We are no longer under the law, because we died to the law, and we died with Christ. Therefore, we live for Christ and not for the law, because Christ lives in us. And the implication of this is that we can't go back to the old way of the law. That would be spiritual suicide. Because not only would it not do us any good, it would also be a rejection of Christ, who is the only way to God. Then in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, Paul wrote, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you because you observed the law, or because you believed what you heard? In this passage, Paul was drawing attention to the Galatians' own experience, and he called them foolish, because their own history showed that they were wrong. Someone had deceived them. Even though they clearly knew about Christ crucified, they no longer made the connection, but were drawn away to something else. So, Paul reminded them that all that they had received, especially God's Spirit, did not come to them by keeping the law, but by hearing with faith. They started well, but now we're foolishly trying to change from a winning horse to a dead horse in the middle of the race. Or, to change the metaphor, 
If you're winning the race by driving a car with a supercharged motor, it would be completely insane to shut off the motor, get out, and start pushing the car. And it's just as stupid to change from trusting God's Spirit in the gospel to your own self effort as the means for salvation and Christian living. So Paul told them if you go back to the law, all your good experiences would have been in vain. Because God is the one who did your salvation, and so God is the one who will empower your continuing Christian life. And, and I pray that none of us gives in to such foolishness as trying to live the rest of our Christian lives by our own resources, in an effort to secure our salvation by our own good behavior. That would be a total waste. We don't have to earn our acceptance with God. Christ has already procured it. We just have to trust Him. Then in chapter 3, verses 6 through 14, Scripture says, Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand, then, that those who believe are children of Abraham. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. This passage is part of Paul's theological explanation and defense of the gospel and he used a number of Old Testament quotes to make his argument. And his argument was that even in the Old Testament, there's only been two choices, faith or law. And there are two clear results of these choices, one good and one very bad. In other words, faith has always been God's plan, even in the Old Testament. First, Paul quoted the Old Testament about Abraham believing God and receiving righteousness. And his point was that those who believe like Abraham share in Abraham's blessing. But those who rely on works of the law are cursed because they don't do everything the law requires. The law is all or nothing. And he strongly asserted that no one is ever justified by the law. And he backed that up with another Old Testament quote, that the righteous will live by faith. And Christ is the one who did this. He redeemed us from this curse by becoming a curse for us, as demonstrated by another Old Testament quote. And Paul argued that the reason he did this is so that Abraham's blessings, including the promise of the Spirit, would come to those who believe in Jesus. And in chapter 3, verses 19 through 25, it says, What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. Is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. In this passage, because Paul had been arguing that the law was never intended to bring righteousness, he addressed the question of the purpose of the law. Why then did God give it? And Paul answered, because of transgressions. Now that partly means that the law keeps transgressions from getting out of hand and therefore protects people from them. You see, if God commands don't murder, this will stop at least some murders. The law was given to restrain sin and prevent humanity from destroying itself. But because of transgressions, 
probably also means to show transgressions to be transgressions, to highlight them and show them to be what they really are, going against God's intentions for his creation, uh, rebelling against God himself. And the law was given until the time of Christ's coming. Paul asked if the law was opposed to the promise, and he answered with a strong negative. And the reason is that the law was never intended to give life, and therefore it was never a rival alternative. The law and promise had completely different reasons and purposes. The law shows that everyone is under sin, it clearly shows the problem, and is intended thereby to force us to look for and then receive the solution offered only in the promise. The promise is through faith in Christ. But before faith, we were under the oppression of the law. The law was to lead us to Christ through faith. And when that has happened, God's people are no longer under the law. And that has happened. Therefore, the Galatians have no need to keep the rules of circumcision. Then is chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. In this passage, Paul applied the big picture history of God's people to the issue at hand. The law was temporary until Christ came on the scene. And Christ came at just the right time in God's plan. He lived under the law, he perfectly fulfilled the law, so that we can be redeemed from the law's demands. So that now, we who trust in Christ, have the rights and blessings of family. And we have realized the promise of God's Holy Spirit, who is both a blessing of our sonship and also the proof of our sonship. If anyone belongs to Christ, they are no longer a slave to the law, but are a son and an heir. Therefore, we should stop trying to live like slaves, scraping about to earn favor from God by our actions. Rather, we should fully live because of the favor that we already have in Christ. Then there are some passages from the section where Paul applies the gospel to the lives of the Galatians. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 6 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith, we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Here, Paul stressed that Christ's goal was to set us free, and he has done that. Therefore, he told the Galatians and us not to submit to slavery to the law again. He told them if they did this by submitting to circumcision, they were choosing a different religion than Christ, and it would end in death. If you try to be justified by law, you are rejecting Christ and grace. But the right way is to hope in the righteousness from Christ. And the reason, he added, is that circumcision doesn't matter either way. The real issue is what you trust in for your righteousness. The false, fatal way is to trust in your own works of the law that somehow you have satisfied all the demands. And the only true way is to trust in Christ, that He has satisfied all the demands on your behalf. And this results in works of love. <laughs>
Then Paul wrote in chapter 5, verses 13 through 25, You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, Paul, Paul knew that his argument may have been misunderstood as an excuse to go on sinning, like he had addressed in Romans. So in this passage, he stressed that the purpose is freedom. But the purpose of this freedom is to live in virtue and love, which is also the ultimate purpose of the law. But there's also, he warned them, the possibility of giving in to selfishness, which would defeat that purpose. The key to victory, according to Paul in this passage, is to live by God's Spirit, and then you won't give in to sinfulness. Because these are two different and opposing impulses warring to rule over us. The Spirit frees us both from sinful selfishness and from the prison of the law. And Paul listed the results of the sinful nature, selfishness and selfish pleasures, which don't ultimately satisfy, but rather divide and alienate us from everything good. And these things separate people from an inheritance in the kingdom of God. But then he also listed the results of the Spirit, which are love, virtue, and personal strengths that bring lasting benefit and happiness. Therefore, we should kill the sinful nature and live by the freedom of the Spirit. Finally is chapter 6, verses 12 through 15, which says, Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. In this passage, Paul gave the motive of the false teachers. They wanted to make a good outward impression, to avoid persecution, but also to pridefully boast in their impact on the Galatians. But Paul called them hypocrites, who did not practice what they preached. Then Paul described his own attitude as a contrary approach. He did not boast in anything but the cross, because he considered himself dead to the world including the need to be accepted and validated by the world's standards. And the world was dead to him. You know, who really cares what they think of you? Care about what God thinks of you. And again, he stressed the circumcision does not matter. What really matters is the new creation in Christ. So the ultimate antidote to the false gospel of the false teachers pressing for slavery to the law is the true gospel of the free grace of God, reconciling people to himself through the cross of Christ and giving them the life of the next age by his Spirit. These then are some, but by no means all, of the key passages that we find in this letter.
So now let's look at the theological themes of Galatians. The first theme is that there is no other gospel except for Jesus Christ crucified and raised from the dead to reconcile us to God by grace through faith and not by works of the law. The false teachers added requirements in order for people to be in right relationship with God. But to add to the gospel is to distort it, and so Paul called them false brothers. The gospel is not about practicing morality. It's not about finding psychological happiness. It's not about making the world a better place. So don't preach any of those things and call it the gospel. Rather, preach Christ crucified and the life change that only he can bring. And by the way, he will bring about all these things I just mentioned as we trust in him and live by his spirit. But don't fall into the temptation of trying to add to the gospel. To add to the gospel is to take away from it. For there is no other gospel, no matter who is telling you otherwise. The second theme is that Paul's gospel is from God. It did not come from Jerusalem or from, from any human, even though it agrees with Jerusalem and the church leaders, because they both got it from the same place, from the revelation of God. And therefore, the gospel from God judges the Jerusalem leaders, not vice versa. Faithfulness to the gospel is more important than human credentials and acceptance. If the Jerusalem leaders acted in a way that was not in line with the gospel, they were wrong. If your pastor or your best friend or if anyone preaches a different gospel, don't believe it. The next theme is faith, not works. The gospel works in lives through faith and not because of people's works of obedience. It gives freedom from the requirements of the law, which no one could possibly fulfill. But it also brings about freedom to uphold the character of the law because of a changed life by God's Spirit. The law was never meant for our justification. The law was meant to bring us to Christ. And the time of the law is finished now that Christ has arrived. And so the next theme is live by the Spirit. Because of the gospel, we can live with character that pleases God and upholds the purpose of the law. Because of the changed life of the new birth, living by the Spirit and being led by the Spirit brings about the fruit of the Spirit in our lives and crushes sinful desires and enables us to live uprightly in service to one another. And then the last theme is the contrast that Paul made between the freedom which comes from Christ and the slavery of living under sin or under the law. Throughout Galatians, Paul used the term prison, prisoner, slave, and slavery to describe the life without Christ and lived under the law. The whole world is a prisoner to sin, and we were held prisoners of the law until Christ came. We were enslaved by the basic principles of the world, but should never again submit to being enslaved by them again. The Old Covenant is like the slave woman and her child, and we should never again submit to the yoke of slavery under the law. By contrast, the life in Christ is described as freedom. We have freedom in Christ. The New Covenant is like the free woman and her child. Christ has set us free for the sake of freedom, and we're called to be free, and so we're not under the law. There is great joy in our freedom in the gospel, and in our deliverance from the bondage of the law, and in our complete forgiveness, free from the penalty of sin. Now, some people mischaracterize following Christ as a life of drudgery and missing out on all the fun, but Paul and Galatians characterize the Christian life as true freedom and joy, both in this life and forever. Christians are the most free people because we're free to do what is right and eternally blessed. And all this is given by grace in Christ and received by faith. Now, however, Paul notes we're to guard ourselves from using our freedom to again serve selfishness and sin because that will lead again into bondage. All right, those are the themes of Galatians. So now let's review. The organization of Galatians is intro, 
no false gospel, the gospel defended, the gospel applied, and conclusion. And the themes of Galatians are no other gospel, the gospel is from God, faith not works, live by the Spirit, and freedom not slavery. Now, Galatians is a very important book, and we've only been able to cover a small portion of its riches. But I hope this gives you a good foundation for further study. And I especially hope that this book has challenged you not to try to earn your salvation in standing with God, but rather to trust completely in Christ and what He has already done, and daily rest on His Spirit and live in a way that pleases Him. In the next section, we'll continue with Paul's epistles, and we'll look at the epistle to the Colossians. Thanks for watching.